Okay, hello everyone. Um, and we're here now for this panel looking at how we build a more robust infrastructure for the metaverse. Now, just that sentence in itself includes a whole variety of different, potentially uh, confusing and controversial uh, words in it, things which, uh, which hopefully will allow us to, to sort of take some deep dives into what's going on um, in terms of where we are with the metaverse at the moment, what's going wrong, what we can actually address, and if we can't in the panel here, then how do we? Um, and where are we aiming to get to at the end of it? So that's a lot of things to, to talk about. I'm uh, Alex Lawrence. I'm a, a journalist working with 6G World, and essentially my job is to look at how we move from uh, the early days of the 2030s, all the way through, or well, the early days of the 2020s even, all the way through to the early days of the 2030s in a way that kind of makes sense and means that, that when we get there, whatever is delivered is, is actually fit for purpose in the world it finds itself arriving into. Um, so it's, it's quite a, a confusing and exciting mission, but uh, happily, as, as a reporter, I don't have to actually do any of the making of it. It's going to be our panelists today who do this. So uh, we have uh, Subroto Mukherjee, uh, Pascal Kemper, and Max Long. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves in turn. Uh, Subroto, let's start with you. Yeah, hi, Alex. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, Subroto here, Subroto Mukherjee. I am currently um, having an advisory firm on future global technology and trying to make it simplify for everyone. Uh, past, I was working with Microsoft, uh, running the Metaverse Accelerator program there, and before that with GSK and then with Verizon for a long time. So the telecom background where we had challenges in how we do telecom uh, activities, uh, or integration, I would say, which one of the roles. So I'm very excited about this uh, today's discussion to talk about the challenges I faced working on the Metaverse part of the world, and also where the technology the infrastructure can really help it to scale up in the future. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Roto. And uh, before we move on, um, let's just define our, our terms a little bit. And can I ask you to uh, just explain what a, what Metaverse means to you? Because I'm, I'm sure that we won't all have the same thing that we're talking about. Yeah, so from my uh, perspective, uh, Metaverse is obviously the uh, area where people can come and meet uh, and then try to get the best experience ever uh, being in that world. Now, that can mean anything uh, since uh, it's like the way we are working on right now. We are having kids playing the the gaming world. People are shopping they're virtual. So it is like a move, I would say a movement from a 2D world to a 3D world where we have a different sort of experience in that space. And again, from a metaverse, we have three definitions, which I was part of the discussions in being in Microsoft is your consumer metaverse, where people are, uh, the regular consumers are playing. Then we have a business metaverse, we call the employee metaverse, where your enterprises are playing in. And the third is very important one is the industrial metaverse, where you have how the industries are using this term to make it really useful and beneficial for them. I hope that kind of summarized my thought process on Metaverse. Great, thanks, Subroto. Then uh, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Pascal to, to do a quick introduction and, and maybe uh, see how your thoughts are on, on what the Metaverse is or should be. Um, yeah, welcome. Um, I'm Pascal Kemper. I'm the CEO of BizLogic, um, and our company has the product Meadow, which is uh, we call it Metaverse as a service, and our um, focus is basically the B2B market, and we try to provide a professional service to bigger corporations, um, especially with a distributed team and international um, kind of setup, um, clients like SAP, Procter & Gamble, BMW. And um, we started classically with events as well as product presentations. So the initial idea, what people, when they come with Metaverse, that's what they come up with most. But now we transitioned, we added to our portfolio mainly the, the inter-corporate um, kind of services like social campus for remote workers, as well as in office workers, as well as onboarding and training um, environments and employer branding. Great, thanks. And last but not least, uh, Max, can we get a, a 
sense of uh, where you're coming from on this. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, my, my name is Max. I'm the co-CEO of Odyssey. I'm excited to be part of this discussion. Um, our company works in, uh, in Unreal predominantly. We, we're a platform for other companies to deploy their high compute Unreal Engine projects on the cloud and then stream them to their end users through browser sessions. Um, that's a technology called pixel streaming. And um, yeah, we we predominantly worked on what we'd call metaverse activations over the past two years, but now we've moved more into general purpose, high compute 3D applications um, inside of the medical sector, architecture, um, yeah, and I, overall, this is kind of where I've seen the trend in the industry is, is uh, uh, the term metaverse maybe opening up from something that was this kind of social event platform to something that's more of a, a indis specific industry use cases finding their niche with this 3D technology and, and, and how that benefits their industry the best. Okay, thanks very much. So we've got uh, three uh associated but but i think quite different perspectives here which is which is exciting and um so you've each given us a, a view i think as to you know where we are today from your perspectives um but obviously when we're talking about building something more robust then that implies that there are pain points and, and issues that that we're seeing in this um, so to come back to, to you, Max, maybe we can um, uh, check with you, what are those, those issues that you've experienced and, and what does need to become more robust in your experience? Well, I think the predominant issue that we've been dealing with for the past year is that um, people are still trying to figure out how to best use this technology and and you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to utilize 3D technology. So taking just a brief step back, I think what I consider the metaverse is industry use cases of um, 3D technology. That's So it's a very broad term for me. Um, you could say like non-video game usage of video game technology is another way of describing it. And yeah, the, you know, people are... People, I think, are still in the learning phase. Uh, early last year, there was a big push, right? There was a lot of excitement about what can this mean for um, for different industries. You know, how it, is it is it VR? Is it AR? Is it web based? Is it these social metaverse experiences? And I think out of that, um, there's been kind of a step back and maybe like a reassessment of what's what's what provides meaning to these organizations, like what has tangible meaning and looking past looking past just the hype of tech being exciting, but actually like what, what does this do for people fundamentally that, that gives them meaning? And thanks, thanks Max. There's, there's a good deal there to, to come back to, but I'm going to hand over to Pascal and Subrato to uh, comment on that if they want, because I, I'm sure that they're going to have some slightly different perspectives on that. Um, and Pascal, perhaps we can get you to comment. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so basically, it's an important point uh, Max already mentioned, and I want to kind of expand on that a little bit. So, for example, our technology started with VR and AR, and um, since we have a professional focus, um, it, the excitement was there, as Max mentioned, and everyone wanted to have the technology, but then we realized we can't distribute it. Uh, broadly, we don't give can't give access to the people because no one has it. We are at it. I mean, on the global scale, the sales sound tremendous, but I, on a global scale, it's not really. And especially in a um, in a corporate setting, um, distributing the devices to access it through a specific technology was different. So we took a step back, um, and ours is now browser based and pixel streamed. So we basically use the technology. Um, provided by the other panelists. And um, so um, we decided to, okay, we, we go every device, cloud rendered, pixel streamed. So everything that has a browser can run it. So 
that is obviously not where people expect the technology to go. Um, and we are very excited to kind of like bring all the technologies together. So it basically is doesn't really matter what your access medium is, but you can access the metaverse as a technology and the service it provides. Um, but right now we are basically bound to the, the devices available. And that is still mobile phones, tablets, laptops. Um, if you want to have a broad distribution. So if you talk about metaverse as a as a technology, a global technology and an interconnected technology, you have to, the other technologies have to, to pick up and kind of like and make be available to most of the people or make it available to all of the devices. Um, and that's what we kind of try to approach. And there are technologies that kind of go there in this direction. Um, and then another pain point we basically have is since we use the cloud rendering and pixel streaming technology, obviously the availability of render um, cert services or graphics in the cloud globally. Um, there are global distributions. There are AWS provides it, um, Microsoft provides it. But if everyone now would jump on the metaverse and kind of cloud renders the service are gone because they're not that many. Um, and as well, there are some region, regions where the, the, the kind of coverage is very limited. Um, and for example, we have some, um, some issues in South America, for example, um, where we really quickly hit the limits of the available infrastructure. And, and there is a lot of investment. AI, for example, crypto helped us a little bit, kind of like expand on that. But I'm certain we have a panelist who didn't talk about that yet and who kind of expand on that. But um, no, so the infrastructure obviously have to build, which is kind of like the core topic of this panel, I think. But as well as the infrastructure, not only from rendering and providing the service, deploying the service, basically, but also the medium to access it. Um, yeah. So those, those are some really important points uh, that you made there, Pascal. I'm going to turn to uh, Sobroto to uh, respond about this, because particularly if we're looking at a resource constrained environment, um, with you coming from the, the telco background as well, it'd be great to, to sort of see what your thoughts are about these pain points and maybe if it is possible at the moment to address some of these. So uh, I think uh, the key thing I want to uh, want to mention that is, again, as this whole metaverse came into play, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of the customers, a lot of the uh, consumers, uh, employees, and even the industrial side uh, was playing in metaverse. Uh, but the key thing was like, did it make uh, immediate business or economic sense from a company perspective to uh, go in this direction? And the second is, do we have enough scale infrastructure available to make it a reality? So those are the key points that I think uh, is taking place right now. And obviously, there are other priorities and economic cycle that's coming into play to kind of a little bit slow it down on that certain areas. And I guess uh, from a teleco perspective, teleco perspective and other areas, uh, the infrastructure needs that is required, uh, it's still not being widely pushed here, right? So there's a lot of uh, near, near uh, edge computing uh, it's there is going on, uh, but there's a lot of more investments need, needed to kind of make it in a reality perspective. And as I think Pascal was mentioning in in uh, South America, the, there's the chances of that you're running out of infrastructure. Now, a lot of the infrastructure is being a little bit shifted towards the compute power needed for metaverse is also shifted towards the AI hype. And we are seeing a lot of people are playing in that space. So I think the key thing is how can we refocus on that and what's the challenge is going to be uh, that will help to drive Metaverse and also the uh, MetaQuest uh, 3 coming out with uh, Vision Pro coming out, the overall organic demand for that will help it to make sure that everybody starts investing more into the infrastructure. And I hope the little bit of AI hype uh, and the corresponding needs for that is a little bit of subsiding will help it to drive up this whole need for the meta uh, Metaverse infrastructure perspective. I hope I that kind of got us answer for that. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Roberto. And I think that um, piece around where we get the compute power, the the AI, the storage as well, I think is is a really critical piece to to talk about. Now, uh, in in many cases, we're talking about going out to the cloud. There are very specific providers there. Edge, it might be a little bit different. So. Uh, I, I wonder, um, Max, Pascal, when you're talking to uh, providers, to what extent that uh, awareness of um, the that underlying infrastructure is is a piece of your conversations with clients, and, and whether bringing in that infrastructure is is a part of those conversations, 
or whether it's it's just kind of assumed that similarly to you know apps and connectivity there's there's kind of a presumption that that things are, are just going to be there until there's an issue uh, max can i uh, turn to you perhaps first there yeah i think when you when you talk about availability of compute and um yeah, maybe jumping off a bit what Sprato was saying in terms of how just globally how much compute is available. You you're solving this problem that's kind of the democratization of 3D, right? Like fundamentally what we're all solving is that you want to build a customer, a team, a company wants to build some kind of metaverse application, and they want every single person that they distribute it to to have the same experience. Right. Like this is what we fundamentally are solving in the infrastructure side of the metaverse. And so if you know, like if everyone has a headset, that's great. But even then, headsets are limited by local compute. Right. And so what Pascal was saying is in terms of them switching completely over to pixel streaming, is um it makes a lot of sense because what you're fundamentally solving is that every single every single user is going to be promised the same experience, right? Given if they have good enough bandwidth on their computer, but they're not limited by local compute, um, what their what their laptop can do, what their cell phone can do, even, even maybe in the future, what headsets can do, right? Like Apple Vision Pro doesn't negate necessarily the need for cloud compute cloud streaming to 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 render something that's higher fidelity or more compute intensive than what it can do uh, natively so yeah like the availability the question of availability is like one there's a question of availability you know how much compute is available in the whole world and to what Sabrato is saying is it is it is being eaten by ai but also it's growing by ai so our company um, works exclusively on uh, CoreWeave servers. CoreWeave is a GPU cloud provider. And early on in that relationship, when they were a smaller startup, they had like two data centers. But then post them making deals with OpenAI and every single other AI provider, they're now scaling massively, right? And so, and NVIDIA is actually just cranking out a huge amount of GPUs that... Um, that they're building for these data centers. So it's actually AI is like increasing the overall availability of compute in the world. I think the the, the metaverse industry can uh, take advantage of and use. And, you know, there's the way that, so there's overall availability, but then I think that there's just using those resources effectively, right? Like talking about pixel streaming in particular, um, you have two methods that you can do. You have, you can have Windows-based virtual machine uh, rendering, which is basically like you, because virtual machines have very long startups, you're spinning this GPU constantly in the background and you have a ton of wastage. A GPU is just running and someone is paying that cost. Um, even if a user doesn't necessarily uh, need to use it that instance. But then there's another way, which is a much more scalable way of Linux containerization using Kubernetes, where you are um, basically just propping up and spinning up a GPU compute when a user needs it. And that's what our company is built off of, but that's solving like basically the constraints of availability, right? Like if there's only so much availability, you really need to build um, your applications to take advantage of that limited availability in, in a very uh, resourceful way. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a, a really important point um, about that, uh, not just scalability, but being able to use the resources available. Um, I mean, Pascal, you're um, a service provider pulling different elements together um, for, for clients. Um, and and again, I guess I'd have to ask sort of how how that filters through to the, the conversations that, that you're having with clients in terms of um 
you know, whether there are limitations that you or, or they are operating within at the moment that um, that are, are technological rather than, if you like, sort of economic in, in their, their nature. Certainly, it is always a complex issue. It also depends on who you talk to in the company. Um, so, for example, usually we go through this typical cycle where the beginning is we want VR for everyone who kind of uses it. Um, that's usually something, as I mentioned at the beginning, which kind of dies down real quick when you talk about, okay, that's the potential distribution um, you have. And that is also the allocated cost to it. Um, and the shortcomings of the application um, you receive them. So, and then oftentimes um, it depends, it's also a little bit a regional thing in our experience, but that might not represent the global market at all. Um, that um, some clients um, immediately start with, okay, we wanna build the capabilities in the house and we don't really care about anything that is um, outside of our sphere of influence. And we, we have the contracts with our partners, but we technically want to have control of it. And then oftentimes you have some players in the market that don't are not afraid of the cost because it's, it is an investment and a significant one for everyone. Um, if you kind of like try to build a metaverse on your own, um, basically infrastructure or build the infrastructure to kind of host the metaverse solution. Um, and it only also only works in, in specific use cases. So for example, if you're regional bound, it might make sense because you don't need server, uh, servers globally distributed. Um, you don't need the edge computing power. You don't need the, if, if you don't have, let's say voice or the interaction between the, the players within the metaverse um, is limited. You might not, the, 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 the kind of latency between them might not be an issue. So there are certain use cases where it makes sense. There are certain players that have the financial means to do it. Um, but usually you go back to the um, approach as we talk. Most of our clients then go back um, to kind of have a service provider. Like we have several players in the market. We already mentioned one. We have the big players as well, um, like Microsoft and AWS, for example. And um, so... And usually it resorts back to them and an on-demand solution, which we basically um, supply as well with our service providers, that you actually kind of use it on demand. Oftentimes you have a baseline of about, we have about 100 servers available that are all the time. So we make sure that people get in um, immediately. But as soon as we reach that limit, um, we do on demand to kind of like optimize costs. It's not optimal yet. There are certainly a lot of kind of like, optimization potential, um, and it has to be. Um, and for example, we use Linux containers as well. Um, it's just so much more um, efficient and cost cost efficient, basically. And also in our experience with our solution a little bit quicker. Um, but there is so much, so many different screws and um, kind of ties to turn that um, it is difficult to see through that. So that's why we, with our, it is a tremendous back and forth. And at some point you have really, it becomes a very technical problem, but also a very strategical problem for our clients, because most of the time when they start a metaverse approach, it already is a strategic topic. So we, let's say with 60% of our clients, we talk C-level um, because they have an initiative. Web3 is one of their top priorities um, or training. We have some training environments um, where we kind of like limit the downtime by 80% of machines. That means six, seven figure savings. So obviously it's a very important um, step for them. And um, and then you have the, 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 the disagreement, okay, it's very important. We have to keep it in out. Security reasons, cost reasons, control reasons, governance reasons, all of that. But then, and then we come back to the economic sense, most of the time, um, it is um, it, it doesn't make economic sense to do it. And generally when we talk the metaverse, as an idea, um, the interconnectivity to different services, different metaverses even, what kind of is a thing we try to um, strive for, um, that obviously might be a very limiting factor. If you house it in-house, you control it, you might shut it down as well. Um, so with that note, kind of like being more open, having it on a more open platform certainly makes sense in that regard as well. If you really want to go through the vision of the metaverse, if you just want to have a tool to kind of fill in certain niches, but don't want to grow, don't want to have a strategy behind it or a vision that kind of is aligned with the metaverse general idea, um, obviously um, you have to kind of like change um, your approach to it. All right, that's, that's neat. Thank you. Um, and so, Roto, I, I see you, you're nodding there. 
Um, so I, I am going to turn to you, but in, in addition, um, we've talked a little bit about uh, scalability, and that's that's clearly one piece of this, this idea of making a more robust infrastructure. Uh, I'm sure if you talk to a lot of people, they, they'd say, well, let's just build out loads more of, of the same thing so that we, we can overcome um, some of these, these resource constraints. But another piece of this is, is that question of uh, reliability and, and just making sure that things, things are available as, as and when they're needed uh, or, or that you're covered in case something goes wrong. Um, I'd be interested to, to get your sense of, you know, to, to, what, um, to what degree we're, we're, we're there yet in terms of being able to deliver that reliability um, when we look at, at sort of cloud-based services, let's say, um, and uh, and what what we can do there that might improve that. Yeah, if um, so, I think a little bit of uh, backtracking, uh, as Pascal was mentioning, right, and I can come back to the reliability point is. Uh, the economic sense is one aspect, definitely, but looking at the mix of people who are going to use it and the CXOs who are getting ready, uh, the the key points we're always talking to them is like, are you going to get ready with just the whole infrastructure or you have any other integration tools to it? Like when you are in the metaverse, just talking to each other is not the only point, but what additional tools and techniques you are using in that metaverse, right? So, and the second point I was part of a lot of discussion where they have uh, people who are ready to use the headsets, which is giving the com complete true experiences. And also the WebGL, which is streaming, pixel streaming, I think vaccine, and uh, we all know that that's the best way to kind of get that uh, outcome. And look at like, okay, as a whole mix of people who has the device, as well as who has on the WebGL or even the pixel streaming, can they have the same experiences or can have a different experiences there uh, was a key factor for most of our discussions because we had situation where we had uh, location and office space where people can use the headsets and we want to have a similar training done with people not on the headsets of uh, what kind of uh, functionality can be there and then what tools within that metaphors can be used while they're doing their activity while they're integrated with the talking to the, each other uh, from whiteboarding can whiteboarding be available can they uh, can interact well can they share information can they share files uh, so if you look at the overall aspect of thing uh, reliability was on a specific very important events where you want to make sure that you are not getting the infrastructure down. There is no QoS going down. There is no dithering happening. Latencies are not a problem. So when you are in overall in office settings, your office networks are pretty well capable to handle that. But you are sitting at home, home and working out of it, making sure you have minimum of a certain latency or uh, internet connections that, that is there to kind of support you to be part of the whole experience at that point of time. So I didn't see reliability as a big point of discussions all the time as making sure that the main events, we have enough bandwidth, enough things to support them. And also limiting the number of people was our key goal because we have not tested a huge variety of people coming in. And we have seen a level up to 50 to 70 people at the moment going on. Act is making sure during that period of time, we don't have any bad experiences being sent out and we have enough interactivity tools available to have that happen. So I think reliability is coming into the level high, but making sure that experiences are not deterred during that time and you have enough ways to make sure people are really uh, getting what they're getting in when they're getting in there. That was the whole aspect at my perspective. Yeah, no, that, that sounds good. Thanks. And there's, uh, heaven knows a lot to, to pick up on there. Um, I'm going to hand over to Max to, to comment because, I mean, again, being the, you know, CEO of a company involved in this space, that, that question of reliability and and who the client strangles if something goes wrong, um, I, I'm sure must be something that, that you know, weighs on your mind a little bit. So, you know, where are those risks for you? And and are, are they things that, that you're able to address as an individual or do you need um, other partners to play a role in that? Yeah, it's a interesting topic because um, I guess the natural tension with the metaverse industry is that, or spatial computing or whatever we want to call it these days, is that it's a new technology fundamentally, right? Like we're we're charting a new path for our customers, 
And generally when you make new technology, it's fundamentally gonna have some hiccups, right? And I think what I've seen is that probably two years ago, those hiccups were okay. Maybe a year ago, the hiccups were okay. People could live with it, you know, but now it's come to a point where industry is actually mature enough where people are building applications that that they really depend on and it needs to be 100% reliable and bulletproof for it to be um to for it to be sold fundamentally for the service to be sold but yeah for no one to get you know to lose their jobs or get upset or something if something goes wrong um and i i mean like to everyone's credit that's working in this industry everyone i think everyone's identified that very early on and you know that that now is that's part of the conversation right like how reliable is this and um you know from 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 us working with core weave right like core weave fundamentally has gotten more reliable as they've scaled and then leading to us right like we have just tons of we've had to build tons of backup systems and regional backups and everything and then you know that's that's um flowed into the customer being able to offer reliability to their their customers right like now they can say well we have we have this downtime um we have a certain amount of downtime that we can look at we have regional backups you know this uh so I mean, across the board, it makes everyone feel more confident about using the technology. And I think it's also gone to the point that since people have solved the reliability issue, you know, you you can use this technology in different industry use cases that you potentially couldn't previously, right? Like if you talk about things like medical, you know, this is this is an industry that there's absolutely no um, leniency to having something be unreliable and solving the re reliability problem opens up this technology to be used by that industry. So, yeah, I, it's, it, it's important and it's getting there. Yeah. I, I wonder if this is an appropriate time to, to open a, a regulatory can of worms, um, in so far as, um, there have been discussions in, in the past about whether it should be possible to prioritize certain forms of traffic over the internet, this kind of thing. Um, and the whole net neutrality debate, I, I hesitate to use those words, but the idea of being able to, um, to pay for a guaranteed quality of service, I think is, is something that, that might, um, be appealing to some people. Um, Clearly, the industry has been able to work around that um, at the moment. But um, to what extent would it be desirable or, or welcome at all to revisit that? Um, I, I see Sobrato uh, grinning slightly there. Um, I, I imagine you've been on uh, you know, involved in those debates in the past. So perhaps you can comment on that. So I have not been directly involved in this debate. Obviously, uh, different companies, telcos and all, have a different perspective on this. Uh, but here is my take on it, right? Uh, Metaverse is not the only emerging technology stack that is there out there, right? There are so many rapid changes of technologies happening. So we cannot start putting up a QS guarantees on a specific technology set. But the demand is so much increasing from every other things coming out, right? Be a metaverse, be it a, a quantum computing coming in the mix. You have a new demand for uh, like the AI coming in. So I think it's a more of like uh, technologists and the companies who are working on this will find a way out of this to make it more nimble, uh, the more uh, efficient way to distribute uh, the information back. Uh, so that will be the key aspect of it. Rather than playing on net neutrality, it has a lot of political angle to it. Uh, it is going to be more of like, how do you eventually increase the investments back into the space uh, from the providers, service providers to cloud infrastructure providers to even your uh, devices coming in to receive that information. So a lot of the optimization is going to start happening in there. It's a kind of a initiative. 
And I think I would say it's another thinking of a world called an iPhone moment, where even if you remember the BlackBerry days, suddenly a lot of data was there. And then iPhone came in and everybody starts stepped in into that moment, right? Uh, it's one of the things we're discussing of my uh, that Emeta was coming this morning, uh, Marco. But the thing is, key thing is like, can the uh, providers start stepping in back, the cloud providers stepping in back, uh, stepping in there and adding up more and more uh, structure to it because of demand coming up in that aspect. So I think whoever wins, who because there's a money value to it, right? When you are putting up the infrastructure, they're going to make revenue out of it. And the needs coming in, it's, I think, a commercial way to drive towards that instead of rather having a more of a regulatory way of doing it, I, I feel personally. And, I mean, we've been talking so far uh, to a good degree about some of the, the sort of physical and logical infrastructure that, that might uh, support uh, a, a future metaverse. But but I think there's, there's another... Um, question and we've touched upon that in in places so far and that's that's questions around uh interoperability and and if we're looking at a, a an organizational infrastructure that, that will allow people to uh develop in a way that's that's for example sort of secure interoperable and so on um i mean maxime pascal you've you've talked about both using uh kubernetes for example which seems like a, a sort of de facto way of, of building sort of standards and, and enabling some form of interoperability there on a basic level. Um, but uh, uh, obviously that's not the same as being able to, to let's say, sort of build once and deploy everywhere. And I'm, I'm curious to, um, to find out from your perspectives, to what degree would something like that be desirable um, or, or, uh, or, or useful for, for your businesses or, or for your clients? Uh, Pascal, maybe I can uh, get you to comment. Yeah, I, I touched on it briefly earlier already. Um, so we are, well, compared to Max, we are on a different layer. Um, let's say we are on the 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 kind of actually you're in the metaverse layer, let's say. Let's call it like this. Um, so for us, interoperability um, becomes very important to the degree that, um, the to be honest, most of the activations are not the metaverse at all. Um, they are little activations and um, they are not interconnected. They are a certain experience. So what we most of the time do with our clients, we start with one little, let's call it miniverse or whatever you want to call it, macroverse. Um, and then you build up, you build a little one. We, for example, we have a, one of our huge clients has different products out of different industries. So we build a universe, a little experience for all of their products. Um, and all of that, You at the end, all of a sudden you have seven, eight, nine um, kind of mini universes. You interconnect them. And all of a sudden, um, there is a service that is connected to one of their products they um, kind of distribute. You bring that in. All of a sudden, you have an external platform that kind of like brings a benefit in there. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's a huge company. It's a global company. They have another um, kind of partner, another agency that builds um, a smaller um, kind of like metaverse-like experience. And then you connect to that one. So from our perspective, it's kind of the natural growth with our clients that you kind of start with an isolated um, kind of like experience. And then from that to build on, you build on, you, you stay internally for, um, let's say, I'm, I'm pulling that now out of my book, but it would be about four to five activations that where you are isolated to yours. And then also you have to kind of like train, you get them closer to the 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 kind of like idea of the metaverse because the client kind of sees metaverse still as I want to show something. That's most of the time how it starts. Not all the time. Some clients are well-versed into the whole thing and they have a clear idea what they want, but most of them want to show something and want to show a new technology. And from there you grow and then you interconnect and then it opens up and then you see the benefits. So you don't really have to argue about, um, is it beneficial to interconnect to different services, different metaverses? Um, on the, 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 let's say, the top layer, um, they, there the benefit becomes apparent, especially if you you have clients that want to join in as well, and you have, a, you have a benefit there as well, because both of you provide and both of you add value. So the discussion usually doesn't really happen. Um, it might happen, especially when it comes to, okay, how does the data flow? How do we cre keep data safe? Um, can we share it with this? How is the, inter that's more kind of like on this layer, um, that's the, the more the data and privacy layer, which is really important, um, obviously. 
But um, on the, the, the vision um, and strategic layer, that oftentimes doesn't really happen because it naturally kind of evolves to it if our clients are committed to it. Obviously, on the technical layer, that's a completely different um, thing. But um, I'm pretty sure Max is well, way better equipped to kind of handle that one. Which is a perfect segue into that. So Max, perhaps you can comment. Yeah, I think I think um, the question of interoperability is, you know, there's there's an if you think about what is the most interoperable environment right now, it's a web browser, right? Like there's a governing body that has decided that web browsers can't fundamentally be set up differently. The code that runs on one can run on all of them given a certain version and um and so you can create these experiences, web experiences that are websites or web apps, and you know that it's going to run on everyone's everyone's web browser on any device. And that's really critical. And I think in our industry, the metaverse industry, we're like well behind that in certain ways. And when I when I think about interoperability, you know, I, I think about a future where um, maybe there's ways that all 3D assets are totally interoperable across rendering environments, but also, also the way that people build the interactions, the, um, you know, what, what, not just like the 3D world, but how, how does a user interact with that 3D world right now? That's code that's compiled inside of Unity or Unreal or any other, any other game engine. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think technology like USD, uh, Universal Scene Descriptor that was created by Pixar is a um, really good step, or GLTF. These are like built to be interoperable 3D, uh, 3D workflows that could work on any rendering um, uh, environment, but also work like on, uh, Epic is doing with their new verse scripting language. I think that's where they eventually want to take that is that they want to create some kind of like massively interoperable, you know, that this is the scripting language that can work in any environment and be ran anywhere. And, you know, uh, that's, there's some future where I think the fundamental 3D or metaverse workflows are just, um, yeah, have some kind of governance of them being promised to work on some sort of version of like a future browser that is like a a 3D browser. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of where I see it going as very high level. Well, that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, bringing in that idea of uh, governance as well, just starts to open up so many more questions, but I, I'm aware that we're running up to time now. So I'm actually going to turn over to our audience to, uh, send in uh, any questions that they might have and, uh, and and then I'll pass them along to Max Pascal and Subrato. So thank you very much for that for now and um, over to you in the audience.